Jeff Holliday did a great and quite moving video about his experiences with mental health issues and depression. It occurred to me that I hadn't really talked about my issues for a while, and I usually do try to mark you know, mental health awareness days and so on by saying something about it. But I realised I hadn't. But then I think that's part of the problem that a lot of us have. We don't want to be a burden to anyone else by talking about things. So if I'm coping, not necessarily in the in the best of ways, but at least coping, I tend not to talk about it. I don't tend to go on about it too much. You know, you're worried about imposing yourself on other people and becoming boring and becoming a sort of one-note depressing person to hang around, I suppose. I have an additional problem in that many of the people who go after me professionally for being a contrarian and liking controversial topics um, attack me on the basis of my depression, trying to say that I'm using it for attention or as some sort of get out of jail free card and it doesn't seem to matter how often or how strenuously I deny this or go against it it just seems to keep coming back up I'm not entirely sure what to do about that other than to say fuck them <laughs> I suppose so I thought I'd talk about it in the kind of longer frame that Jeff gave so I'm very much inspired by Jeff good, good video Jeff I guess I was always a quiet, introspective kind of kid, more at home in a book or playing a game or in my own imagination than anywhere else. Socialising didn't particularly come easily to me. I always had this really acute sense of embarrassment on the behalf of others, <laughs> let alone myself. So, you know, if another kid slipped and fell or made an idiot of himself or pooped his pants or whatever, I, I felt the, the cringe as badly as they did. Um, or at least it felt like it to me. And that always made socialization a little bit difficult. I was also, you know, pretty, pretty horribly bullied at a couple of different periods in my life. Primary school and uh, secondary school where I was essentially kicked in the bollocks pretty much every lunchtime by the same set of kids for a couple of years, really. So, you know, that was a special experience that really fills you with confidence and not dread. Looking back, I think the depression probably actually started around my mid-teens, so, you know, 15, 16, 17... It's not particularly noticeable if you happen to adopt a goth style as I did. You know, it's assumed to be part of the part of the act, I suppose, part of the the presentation of being part of that subgenre. But I suppose that it just spoke to me and fit, and that was the reason I was doing it. So it wasn't necessarily part of a performance, exactly. And it was while I was at college uh, that my parents split up which was difficult. It wasn't a particularly particularly acrimonious or horrible split, you know. They weren't throwing things at each other. They never physically attacked each other or anything. Nobody was ever horrible to me. My parents were perfectly lovely to me and very encouraging and supportive and everything else. But I was just kind of fairly abruptly and suddenly left having to look after a devastated mother and a brother who was already difficult as a child, lots of tantrums and so on. He's a he's a pretty good good guy now, but as a kid he was he was fucking off the rails a lot of the time. Uh, so that was that was difficult. And that kind of made things worse. And you know, the college noticed and tried to intervene, um, made me start going to see a college counsellor. I kept deflecting everything off from me, saying that, you know, I was concerned about my 
my brother and my mum. And that kind of worked, really, <laughs> to take the focus off me. And they did need help, and they got various forms of assistance. Um, and people stopped bugging me, <laughs> which was nice. But yeah, you know, maybe I could have gotten more out of it if I if I'd bought into the whole thing back then. Things really came to a head with a relationship that went bad. Um, it's cliched and hackneyed, I suppose, to kind of uh, swoon and hurt yourself over over a girl it wasn't ever a kind of threat per se to try and make her to to stay with me but it was a kind of my first really intense proper relationship and when it ended it was absolutely devastating to me and that would have been the first couple of times i tried to kill myself were around that sort of that sort of period you know, we we went around and around, me and this girl, and it didn't work out in the end. But that kind of you know, be, being dumped essentially more than once was was pretty devastating. But, you know, you kept you keep going back for whatever reason. But that was really a trigger event for the underlying depression. And the feeling that wasn't really getting anywhere in life, I suppose. And that whole imposter syndrome thing that a lot of people get, a lot of, a lot of artists get. Yeah, and I'd been forced to give up on my artistic ambitions. Um, looking back, I'm not sure whether I was good enough or not. But the problem was that I was into illustration and comics and manga and science fiction covers and things like that and the available art education at the time very much wasn't supportive of that kind of thing it was fine art or design were your choices really there was only one place that was remotely adequate to what I wanted to do and that was in Salford in a really shitty area far far away from from home and I just couldn't face going there so I kind of gave up on the artistic side of what I wanted to do and kind of fell into writing later and this is all before I even got any kind of diagnosis but I was you know horribly depressed I just didn't really realize it I suppose I was getting by on games and fiction and spending a huge amount of time on the nascent internet you know, staying up late when the phones were free and weren't being charged on, you know, using up the line from, you know, 11 p.m. through till 5 a.m. and then, then going to sleep, you know, spending inordinate amounts of time on IRC and email lists and looking for a way out, I suppose, um, finding more wholesome ways than harming myself or whatever. And I was never really one for drugs or drink particularly. So those outlets were a lot healthier. And that's a huge part of why games became so important to me and integral. It was something I enjoyed. It was something I could do, something I was good at. I'm not saying it's part of my identity exactly, even though it's my career and my hobby and everything else, you might think that I would say games is my identity. I don't know that it is. It's just, it's my, it's my thing, my way of coping, my way of doing something of worth and feeling accomplishment. But I do still feel that imposter syndrome, even to today, you know, doesn't seem to matter how many things I write or how many good or bad reviews or whatever I get. You never really shake that feeling. There's that stereotype that there is of, you know, the, the mentally ill artist or whatever. Apparently it's not true, except for writers, which is, of course, what I do. Writers do have a higher level of depression and people have tried to puzzle out why. Maybe it's the introspection that helps with writing, helps you think. 
gives you that level of focus on fine detail that you often use to criticize yourself, but which you can use perhaps to refine your writing. A lot of comedians as well, who are really writers when you think about it, seem to have that same kind of focus and need to produce, to get out of themselves, I suppose. I dread to think how long ago now it is that I was actually formally diagnosed with depression, but I really fought against that diagnosis for a very long time. I didn't want it to be true. I didn't necessarily feel depressed per se. I felt tired, exhausted all the time. Um, I just wanted to sleep all the time. I had aches and pains like flu-like symptoms almost only without the sniffles and the and the snot and the rest. So I really thought it was something more like chronic fatigue syndrome or something like that. But batteries of tests over and over again, doctors insisting, oh, you, you might be depressed. No, I don't think so. I don't feel sad or whatever. These physical symptoms made me feel that it couldn't be depression. Um, but, you know, I went through all the tests and everything else and, saw multiple doctors and in the end just kind of exhausted I guess um, let them diagnose me with depression and the medication is useful um, I wouldn't encourage anyone to avoid medication but getting on the right medication is a bit of a trial you have to get the dose right, you have to get the drug right, and then you're never really settled because the requirement is constantly changing. You need to balance between being functional um, and not being depressed. At higher doses, they can zombie you out. At lower doses, they don't necessarily help. And while you're figuring out your dose, you're taking your drug, it takes a, you know, a few weeks normally to build up in your system and have an effect. And in that time, it can make your depression worse. So I think I'm on my fifth drug now, uh, having varied experiences with different ones. Some of them did absolutely nothing at all. Some of them knocked me the fuck out. One of them gave me screaming night terrors, uh, but was otherwise good. This current one seems to have minimal side effects, but not a huge effect. But since I'm kind of bumbling along reasonably okay for the most part, it seems to work. But the other problem is that taking these drugs can have an effect on your creativity. So if you are an artist or you are a writer, sometimes you're making a choice between can I work or do I want my brain to work? <laughs> You're making a choice between being creative or being depressed. Um, and that's not an easy choice to make. And that's another reason to keep balancing and fiddling with your dosage. But there's a lag on the dosage of the drugs that you take. So this is a huge pain in the ass. And if it's your job, it can make things really difficult for you. Uh, really difficult to, to make money, to keep making money. It's it's a miracle that I am productive as I am. Um, I would, quite honestly, like to get some financial support um, because I do still find it very difficult to work. It takes a huge amount of effort. But I've still got my pride. I would rather not make recourse to, to public funds if at all possible and the other problem is that getting those funds even if I did decide that I wanted to has become increasingly difficult there's all kinds of rather intrusive checks and fitness for work tests and, you know I can work just not reliably <laughs> that's the problem so a little bit of support just to make things easier would be good but there's basically no option for me to do it Plus, depression is an invisible illness. It's not something so easily assessed by a, by a board of barely trained people in the way that 
physical ailments are. Then there's therapy. My experiences with therapy have been, shall we say, mixed. The big problem is that the kind of aid that you can get freely, or at least cheaply and easily, is very much a one-size-fits-all solution, um, CBT, which does not, in this instance, stand for cock and ball torture, which I doubt would help very much anyway. This is cognitive behavior therapy. And this is basically all that they offer on the NHS, unless you're bad enough to be put away in an institution, which I nearly was once, but narrowly managed to avoid. So CBT is basically positive thinking. And if you're at all skeptical, if you're at all cynical <laughs> in the way that I am, it doesn't really work for you very much. There's a few kind of intellectualizing exercises and so on that do work well that are contained within it, but as an overall thing, it wasn't very useful. I was extremely fortunate in that with assistance, I was able to leave that so someone else could, could get my slot, who might have gone with it better, and to get some private assistance from a therapist who fortunately was very local and relatively easy to get to and everything. Uh, he specialised in men's psychology and he did a holistic, humanistic sort of a, sort of approach, making contracts with each other, that sort of thing, giving me attainable goals, you know, targets to work for, homework almost. And that was very helpful for, I guess, a couple of years I was going to that um, before it it kind of declined in usefulness over time. Um, and in the end, I decided to, to pack it in to save, save the money instead, basically. And I was doing okay. Those suicidal moments, though. It's hard to explain to people exactly how they happen or what it's like. It can happen for no real reason. You don't have to have a trigger exactly. Uh, it can happen just because you happen to feel low and worthless and you're bursting into tears for no reason sometimes or wanting to and being unable to. It's just... It's like grief it's like having your heart broken in the absolute cruelest most horrible way possible but it doesn't fade with the same kind of rapidity and it's hard to find something to to put your finger on to blame Things don't exactly trigger it, but if you're already low, something bad happening takes on a whole new catastrophic level of meaning. It seems that much worse. Like I say, it's really hard to explain, but then you're at that point where everything just feels like it hurts it's worthless you're never going to dig your way out of this pit or you know that even if you do get better that you're going to feel this way again and it's absolutely horrendous imagine you were caught in a bear trap in the middle of absolutely you know nowhere there's absolutely no chance of anyone rescuing you and you know agony setting in and the gangrene is setting in and you can't sleep and you can't move you know, just just the beat of your heart sending blood through your leg is is enough to send paroxysms of agony up and down your spine and there's just there's just no way out and you can't see any way out and you've got no hope of getting out that yeah you know, would you consider killing yourself or would you wait to starve to death or wait for some animal to come along and find you you know would, would you take the the easy way out that's 
what that's what it's like. You just want out. You want it to stop. You want it to to end. It's unbearable. And you don't think anyone will miss you. Um, you think you're a you're a burden to everybody, and you just want to not only end yourself but relieve other people of the burden that is you. And it doesn't matter how much they say they love you. It doesn't matter how much they say they want you around. It doesn't matter what what efforts they go to, though they're appreciated afterwards. There's nothing makes any difference. You don't believe them. You can't believe that anyone would want you or love you or care about you or want you to be safe. You know, you're, you're worthless. You're scum. Why would anyone actually care? What, what are they trying to get out of this? It doesn't make any sense. It completely distorts and warps your thinking. And that's why I found kind of distancing myself from emotion, intellectualizing to be so useful because it's let me step outside of that feeling and weigh and measure my situation rationally and and at a distance and that has been useful um, as a way of avoiding that as has getting angry it's much nicer for me to lash out and find some injustice or problem to fight rather than to have all that energy aimed inwardly, tearing myself down and ripping myself apart. And that's another survival mechanism, but neither of these necessarily helps you get on with other people. You know, if you're constantly trying to be objective and rational, you necessarily end up upsetting people's feelings. And when you take on a cause that, that means something to you, um, that helps you cope, and you become focused on that. That can be alienating to people. And uh, some people don't like it when you fight, even when you're fighting for the absolute best possible reasons. So now, where am I? I'm okay. Um, I'm getting along. It's ups and downs with depression always. So you constantly have to kind of monitor your dose, especially if you're creative, because you want to stay creative, but you want to stay alive. I'm not in therapy anymore, but I'm trying to be more open with people who are my friends about my situation and how I'm feeling. I'm trying to concentrate a bit more on self-care, which is difficult for me because it always feels selfish when you hear other people saying, you know, I'm going to take time for me or whatever. It always sounds pretentious and stupid and selfish. And sometimes you've got to take care of yourself. But that's always been difficult for me. I think when my parents split, my way of coping was to look after everybody else and to put myself last. And that became very much a habit um, move, moving forward from there. And it's incredibly hard to break out of those kind of habits once they're, once they're ingrained, especially if they help you survive. But I'm okay. I'm getting along. It might not last. <laughs> we shall see. But at the moment, I'm okay. So, you know, if you're suffering, maybe you can get to the point of being okay too. Uh, I don't think I'm in the same situation as Jeff. He was saying very much that it gets better. For some people, it does. For some people, you get over these kind of things. They don't reoccur. You know, you, you sort yourself out. Something switches, something clicks, something changes. And then you're okay moving forward into the future. Maybe you have another bout later on down the line, but... For others of us, I don't want to be disheartening, but it doesn't get better. You come to realize that this is something you're going to be living with for the rest of your life and coping with one way or another. So it doesn't get better. You have to come to terms with it. You can cope with it better. You can add to your arsenal of tools and so on, but it's always going to be there 
and you have to work around that, make it survivable, make it livable. The other problem you have is that people are constantly trying to sell you something when they know that you're ill. Like, read this self-help book, or have you tried these exercises, or, oh, you should eat this, or they send you every article about every fringe treatment that you'd never able be, never ever be able to get on the shortlist for, um, think, thinking they're helping, or sending you crystal healing things, or whatever other nonsense that it might be. Religion's the big one. The, you know, people seem to sense weakness, <laughs> try to, try to sell you on Jeebus. Um, you know, they, they mean well. And it can be difficult for some people to understand how a godless heathen such as myself can, can cope. You know, they think that I'm depressed because I'm an atheist or something. Well, it's just briefly worth touching on that, I think, before I finish up. Here's the thing. The universe is really, truly enormous and expanding. The vast majority of that universe is empty space with nothing in it. A tiny minority of the universe is matter. And a tiny minority of that matter is collected in stars and planets. On Earth, which is one tiny speck in that enormous void, only a thin smear of matter on the surface is alive. Of that tiny thin smear of organic matter, only a tiny fraction of that life is sentient in any real meaningful way. Humanity is only a, a part of that enormous amount of biomass. So we are such a rare and special thing, even if there is other life in the universe, even so, on that scale, the, the mere presence of, of conscious thinking life is tremendous. You know, I have this amazing opportunity to think and to feel and to experience that the vast and overwhelming majority of the universe will will never get. And it would be churlish to just waste that, you know? That's what keeps me going. Thinking about how lucky I am even to have the experience of pain even to have the experience of despair and depression and, and hurt just to be able to experience those things is an enormous colossal bordering on miraculous occurrence so from my point of view from my entirely atheistic naturalistic materialistic point of view Life has intrinsic and incalculable value just on that basis. But I'm okay, and you can be too. So chin up, carry on. And if you need me, I've got you. <laughs>